Here now the readings. First, a word from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. Hear this word. God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And then, turning over to Luke's Gospel, hear this word, a parable, in keeping with our sermon, third installment today of the Lenten sermon series on parables. This one, one of the most familiar of Jesus' parables from Luke chapter 10. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But Wanting to justify himself, he asked, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said to him, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that we might be the masters of ourselves to become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for thee. Amen. There is a story I like and that I have long remembered by a uh, Colorado theologian, the late Harvey Potoff. He used to tell this story to all of the uh, first-year seminarians who had enrolled in his Theology 101 class, and, and I was among the many students over the years who heard him tell the story. It's about a time when he was on vacation from his Denver home out uh, in Wyoming one summer, and he stopped one afternoon at a souvenir shop outside of Laramie, Wyoming. He said, the shop caught my eye because it was uh, an old converted saloon. Uh, it had been in its early life a saloon and a gambling house operating for years on the outskirts of Laramie. And it was still a pretty original building to its 1880 origins. They, they still had gaming tables inside, and, and they had a great big uh, mahogany bar, kind of fancy, exquisite bar. Though now, he said, uh, those tables and the bar were filled with T-shirts and plastic tomahawks and, and all the kinds of things that you find in, in Western souvenir shops. Fossils and rocks and petrified wood and all of those kinds of things. So, so I was in there looking around on my vacation and, and I noticed near the back of the shop there was a, a door and over the door uh, into the next room there was a sign that read, 
the crying room. And I, I asked the proprietor of the place, I said, what's that sign all about? What's the crying room? And, and I was told, well, in the old days, that was the place where the gamblers would go and express their dismay in private after they had spent time at the tables and lost all their money, hence the crying room. But, but he said, come on in and see what we have in there now. And he said, I went in with the proprietor, and, and inside the room, there, there were shelves filled with what to my eye, looked to be utterly ordinary rocks. I said, if I had seen any of those rocks on a hillside or on a path that I was walking down, I would have kept going, not giving them a second glance. And so I looked, and I'm perplexed, and sensing my skepticism, the, the store owner closed the door to the crying room uh, that we had just entered, he said, making it pitch dark inside, and then he turned on an ultraviolet light, a black light, and in an instant, these rocks, which were geodes, crystals, they, they all of a sudden, they come alive. He said it was just amazing. There were these bright arrays of color, and it was vivid, and they, their iridescence just kind of shone from them. Uh, it, it seemed almost miraculous to me. And he would conclude the story by saying, for me, it was no crying room, but quite the opposite. It was a place where I learned in a vivid way that it makes all the difference in the world in what light we see our lives. He said to these uh, beginning theologians, including me, he said, religion is really a way of seeing, isn't it? It's a lens that we employ as we go through life, how we are going to choose to look at things. He said, think about it, if you get up every day believing that you are a rat in a rat race or a cog in a machine, that lens, that lens will make a huge difference in what your life comes to mean and how you see your everyday experience. The contrary is also true. If you go through life looking for what is holy and for the, the wonder and the, the mystery and the good to be present even in everyday moments, your life inevitably will expand and it will be more like that. Religion is a way of seeing. It's a particular light on life that's important to know. And I, I remember that in connection with the text today uh, because I think it's not a stretch to say that the parables of Jesus and particularly this story of the Good Samaritan is a little bit like th the light coming on. And, and seeing things that had, would otherwise we'd be tempted to think were pretty ordinary. I have to think that if, if we could magically find that lawyer who had first asked the question of Jesus that prompted him to tell the story, the lawyer who'd come up to him and said, who's my neighbor? If we could find him and ask him, what did this interaction with Jesus do for you? I think he might say, he expanded my vision. He turned the light on for me in a way that helped me see something wonderful that I, up to then I had not seen. That story of the Good Samaritan, it's one of those parables that is so well known it, the, even the term has become kind of a byword in our language. Even religious people know about the story of the Good Samaritan. If you run a Google search on the word Good Samaritan, or the two words Good Samaritan, as I did this past week, in an instant you get hundreds of thousands of hits. There are Good Samaritan hospitals. There is a, a Good Sam RV club, you, I, I, which I learned you sign up for the Good Sam RV club, and it's a, you, you kind of promise that you'll help somebody if they, you see their broken down RV on the road. You'll help, promise to help, and in return you get help by anybody else. The Good Sam RV club, there are a whole bunch of uh, uh, articles on Good Samaritan laws. It's just one of those stories that we know so well it's almost too familiar to us. It's easy to forget what a challenge the story would have been to the first people who heard it. Uh, I heard somewhere uh, it said that there are two tasks of, of healthy religion. The two tasks of healthy religion are to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And, and I think this story comes through on both counts. Uh, the one it afflicts, at least temporarily, the comfortable one it afflicts, of course, is that lawyer. And, and incidentally, it's important to say that in those days, back in first century uh, ancient Near East, uh, lawyers were more like uh, religious. They were more like theologians. They were students of the law, which was the religious law. Uh, a, a lawyer stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, 
What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do to inherit a life that is satisfying and rich and has this dimension of goodness that I want to have that outlasts me? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Rabbis had this sort of conversation with lawyers all the time. Uh, and, and when uh, he asked this question, Jesus responded in keeping with the custom of these kinds of discussions by asking a question back. What is in the law? How do you read it? And right away, we learn that the, the lawyer is a, a good student. He, he knows the answer right on the, right on the spot, and he's got it exactly right. It's the same answer Jesus once gave when he was asked what's central to living a, a faithful life. He quotes the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus nods. You have answered rightly. Do this and you shall live. And at that point, you know, you could think the exchange would be over and they'd go on to something else now. I mean, a question has been asked, it's been answered, everybody agrees that it's the right answer, case closed, let's go on to something else. But uh, in the story, of course, it doesn't happen quite that fast. And, and Luke, who, the gospel writer who, who records the story, you get a sense from Luke that he's a little irritated with the lawyer. He, he's, he, Luke thinks there's a problem. Uh, it, it's, it's not been, in Luke's eyes, quite the honest exchange of ideas that, that it might appear to be on the surface. You know, it, honest in the sense that the lawyer has asked an honest question, he's got his answer back in response. You can tell Luke is a little uneasy about it all. He's raising his eyebrows at the lawyer a little bit by the editorial comment. He didn't have to put this in. And desiring to justify himself. Now, that's not a friendly comment. Luke's not too keen on it. And desiring to justify himself. The man said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And when you think about it, that question is a little fishy, coming from a student of the law. The lawyer, good lawyer though we know he is, he would know exactly who his neighbors were. The definition of neighbor was what much of the law spelled out in painful detail. It's all there in the old priestly code, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. It goes on and on about who's in and who's out in the eyes of God. What constitutes a neighbor and what constitutes an outsider. Uh, he would have studied all that in great detail. So when he asked this question, who is my neighbor? He already knows the answer. You know, they, they, I think they teach you that in law school, don't they? We have lots of lawyers. You're not supposed to ask a question unless you already know the answer. That's what you do in court, right? He already knows the answer. Luke, Luke thinks it's fishy. Just desiring to justify himself, he asks, who is my neighbor when he already knows the answer? Or he thinks he knows. Neighbors, by definition, according to the ancient law, would have been people just like himself. Good practicing Jews who kept the same holiness codes, practiced kosher the same way, the same cleanliness laws, same holiness laws, all of those things. They were the neighbors, and everybody else were the goyim, the outsiders. Uh, uh, the, the boundaries in those days between the, the neighborly tribe and the tribe of outsiders were as clear and well-defined as they had ever been in human history. And the lawyer would have known all that. But he still asked the question, which I think is great. I'm not, I'm not with Luke on looking down my nose at the lawyer. I think it's great he asked the question because he opened the door for Jesus to turn on the light and see things in a new way. Well, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, where he fell among the thieves who robbed him and stripped him and beat him and left him for dead. A priest and a Levite both careful followers of the Jewish law, both obvious neighbors by any definition that the lawyer would have studied. They are the neighbor, they're insiders to the hilt. They see the victim and they both pass by on the other side of the road, giving the, him a wide berth. Incidentally, the, the late Peter Gomes of Harvard, he was for years at Harvard Memorial Church, he wrote an essay on this passage once in which he suggested that maybe the priest and the Levite were on their way to a church committee meeting to discuss how to make highways safer for pedestrian travel. <laughs> a priest and a Levite passed by on the other side. And it's interesting 
Jesus does not linger with why they did that. You know, there's no finger shaking or, or you know, uh, he just lets us speculate. Why would these people have done that? Maybe they were callous. Or, or some scholars have suggested that maybe they would have found themselves, a priest and a Levite, caught in an uncomfortable bind. Uh, the bind would be this, that, that if they were on their way to uh, officiate a, a religious ceremony at the temple, they were obligated. It was their duty to keep themselves ritually clean. Uh, that was the requirement of leaders, and, and if you were going to uh, be ritually clean, it would be absolutely forbidden for you to touch somebody that you thought was dead or, or that somebody who was bleeding. That would render you unclean and not able to lean. So maybe they were conflicted. Maybe they were caught between two competing values, and they just made a bad choice uh, in that way. You can at least imagine a scenario where their neglect of the victim would be understandable. But interestingly, for whatever reason, they pass by, and Jesus doesn't linger on it. He just says, that's what happened, and, and on with the story. It's the good Samaritan who comes to the rescue. To a first century Jew, the term good Samaritan would be an oxymoron. It would be like saying the, the helpful terrorist or something like that. The good Samaritan, unimaginable to put those two words, Samaritan and good, side by side. Samaritans had been hated by Jews for centuries. The, the, the animosity went all the way back to the 8th century BC. The Samaritans were descendants of the Assyrians who had first made themselves known to the Israelites way back then, eight centuries earlier, when they attacked Israel and took much of the southern part of the kingdom for, uh, for the kingdom of Assyria. And that hatred between Jews and Samaritan had lingered ever since, 800 years. And it was still just as real as it had been when the first Assyrian occupation had begun. A, a wall of disdain and a wall of separation between these two tribes of people. So imagine how stunning this story would have been as Jesus spins this tale out. Uh, when, he, when the Samaritan saw him, he was moved with pity and went to him and dressed his wounds and put him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. Then the next day he returned and paid the innkeeper two denarii, saying, provide anything he needs, and when I return, I will make it right. So, which one, Jesus said, proved neighbor to the man? And, and by then, of course, the answer is obvious. The, well, the one who showed him compassion. And then Jesus brings it in for a landing. Well, then go and do that. Go then and do likewise. I notice in reading this story that there seem to be two things going on here. First is the obvious thing, that the lawyer is told that he is obligated to practice a love that's bigger than his own tribe. And he's obvious that he's to practice a love in, in the same way the Samaritan demonstrates it. Go, go thou and do likewise. Well, what, what was the like? What did the Samaritan do? He shows a love that has no boundaries and demands no repayment for, for those it helps. It's, it's not enough, Jesus is saying to that lawyer, for you to know the law or to talk a good game. You want eternal life? You want to have the sort of generous... Uh, uh, life that, that uh, you will take you into a dimension that you, you're not there now, you want to you expand your spiritual depth, you have to live that sort of generous, boundary-crossing love. Go and do likewise. The, the, practice the love the Samaritan had. That's kind of the obvious point. It's not enough just to talk a good game or to know the, the law and, and not let it go deeper than that. It's, it's the obvious point, but I don't think it's the main point because if you think about it a little more, the, the lawyer already knows that he's supposed to be helpful and he knows he's supposed to love others beyond his sphere of clan and those just like him. And how do we know he knows that? Well, we, we know that partly because right before the story begins, he quotes that from the Shema, love the Lord with heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself. He knows that's part of the law. And, and also, he would have, as a student of the law and the Old Testament, as a theologian, he would have heard many times uh, the, the call that, uh, of our ancient ancestors to practice a love that extends beyond just the, the limited tribe. Seek justice, Isaiah says. Care for the orphan. Plead the widow's cause. He would have read that. Or he would have read from Micah, what does the Lord require of you? 
to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. So he knows, he knows there is a call to love that requires you to put it into practice and not just talk a good game, though no doubt Jesus thought he needed the reminder. That's part of it. I think he, Jesus wanted to remind him because sometimes the hardest thing, the hardest thing is to get something we know here here, right? I mean, that, that's really true. Uh, Fred Craddock, the great preacher of the last century, used to say, sometimes the farthest journey a person can take is the 18 inches that goes from something that's in your head, getting that to be in your heart. It can be the, the longest journey you can take. So that's one thing that's worth pointing out. Jesus calls the lawyer, you know, to go from here to here with what you know about the law. But m maybe more important, is how Jesus forced the lawyer to see something about God that really was, uh, was mind-expanding for him. Uh, to make a Samaritan the most hated person uh, in, the, in the categories that this lawyer would have, uh, would have had in his mind, a hated Samaritan as the hero is a way to say, in, in, in the most dramatic way possible to somebody in the first century, by the way, oh, by the way, with me, with me, old hostilities and old hatreds that you hold on to for so long, those things won't stand. The dividing walls between people in my kingdom, Jesus is saying to the lawyer, those are coming down. They will come down. They're not down yet, but they will come down, and they will come down sooner rather than later if you, the lawyer, if you live as though they were already down. I think that's really the second and maybe the deeper point to the parable. Those old hostilities, they're on their way out. And they'll be on their way out if you ally yourself with the purposes of God and, and respond as though they're already done. Uh, there's a story I like very much. Uh, some uh, years back during Lent, uh, we studied a book, Vanishing Grace. The men's, uh, the men's study did it uh, at noontime during Lent by a writer named Philip Yancey. And for me, the best story in the book of Vanishing Grace was about a, a friend of Philip Yancey's. He wrote this about his friend, uh, the late Francis Collins. Francis Collins was a physician who once headed up the National Institute of Health in Washington. And uh, uh, Francis Collins, in addition to being a great physician, was also a very dedicated Christian. And on one occasion, he was invited to visit Oxford University where he had the chance to meet and debate the stridently anti-Christian, anti-God philosopher, Christopher Hitchens. You remember Christopher Hitchens? Uh, some of you may know that name. He was an articulate writer who believed earnestly that religion did more harm in the world than it did good, and, he, and that we would be best, uh, better off as a society if, just, if, if we just got beyond religion, which he regarded as superstition. He, he wrote in a very provocative way, and, and he became really quite a popular author. Articles would always have eyebrow-raising titles. The Fanatic Fraudulent Mother Teresa, he published in Vanity Fair. And his most famous book, uh, went on, bestseller on the New York Times book list for a long time, God is Not Great. And it was a kind of a guiding work for people who felt faith in God should be relegated to the uh, superstitions of the past, and, and, and now science can bring us up and teach us that, what we need to know, and, and we can put away all that religious nonsense. Anyway, uh, Francis Collins and Christopher Hitchens meet, and they debate at Oxford, neither man winning the other over, uh, but they parted company without malice and, and hostility. They, they just agreed to disagree. And then, according to the story, some months later, Hitchens, this devout atheist, uh, uh, was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. And he began to chronicle his treatment and, and impending demise in columns in Vanity Fair magazine. Well, when Francis Collins found out about his plight, he phones Christopher Hitchens from his Maryland home. Uh, and he said, you know, I'd be happy to come see you. In England, I'll come at my own expense. Uh, uh, I can talk to you about some experimental treatment options. You know, it, you, uh, if esophageal cancer is what I know most about in all this world. He was, he was an expert at that. And Hitchens says, yeah, come. I would love to have you come. And, and, and he, he did. And the two uh, struck up a, a, a friendship. But Hitchens lived about another year and a half. And, and interestingly, as the friendship developed, the, the, you know, this devout Christian man 
and Christopher Hitchens, the sincere atheist, uh, their friendship uh, develops, and the the columns uh, Hitchens was writing in Vanity Fair, they began to soften dramatically in in, in their criticism of Christianity, largely because he was seeing a, a side in it from his friend that he never knew existed before, the side of compassion and kindness. And, and Philip Yancey, in, in telling the story, says this, Hitchens had no deathbed conversion, but from one friend at least, he received a firsthand experience of the love of God. Francis Collins, Yancey went on to say, is to me a living embodiment of the Bible's requirement to the early church that we see to it that no one miss the grace of God. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. That may be exactly why it was a Samaritan who Jesus singled out to be the one embodying the essence of care and kindness in that story. It's another way of reminding the lawyer, and I think by extension certainly us too, that we in the church are called to live toward the dawn where there are no insiders and outsiders, but only children of one father. For that light that is both ahead of us and breaking into the midst of our community now, we give thanks. And because of that light, we have hope. Amen.
Except we pray, O God, this offering of your people and grant that the works to which they're devoted may prosper under your guidance to the glory of your name. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Let's remain standing as we join in our closing hymn, Where Charity and Love Prevail.